two, one, and we are live, everyone, for a new episode of the Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintram. How are you doing today, Seth? I'm good. All right, coming us live from Berlin uh, hmm. for IFA, is that right? That's right. Um, sorry for the sound quality right now. Uh, my dongle for my external microphone, I have like nice fancy sure microphone but uh it is useless without a dongle that uh, just seemingly gave up on me right now so we're gonna have to endure this uh this level of sound quality coming out of my macbook pro i hope it's tolerable uh again i apologize it's gonna i'm gonna try to fix that by next week because uh we're gonna be doing this show from the road for the next two weeks um all right Let's jump right in because we might not have good sound quality with this show, but we have good news, or at least a, well, not good news necessarily, but a lot of important lots news. Lots of news. Yeah, yes. lots of important news. Quantity is high. Yeah, the quantity, uh, but also the the impact of the news. So it's not necessarily yeah. good or bad. It's just big news. Uh, let's start by the obvious, the Model 3 Highland. Model 3 Refresh, Model 3 Facelift, Model 3 Updated, however you want to call it. It's here now. And uh, yes, it's uh, it's exactly what we've been expecting based on the prototypes that have been spotted out there. This sharper, uh, more aggressive front fascia, updated tail light, updated headlights. Um, a little bit more, a little bit more interior updates maybe than uh, we were expecting. So that's uh, that's nice on this front. But yeah, uh, the the exterior you see the pictures here. Uh, it's it's very much what we've saw, and especially the prototype that has half, halfway covered that we already saw the front hand. This this is it basically. Um, I I've been trying to get a pulse on people in terms of what they think of the update, and it's uh it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, yeah, like a lot of people very lo love it very much. A lot of people say it's pretty mild and the front end is a bit polarizing where people say it's a step back from the front end uh personally i i love it i mean i said it when i when it first leaked a few months ago but i very much like the front hand i think it's a lot sharper uh makes it the makes the car looks a little bit more aggressive um and the the rest of the like the i, I admit that the rest of the design updates are fairly small but the the match together very well like the, the with the sharpness of the front end i think the tail light and the and the headlights are are, are, are complements it very well i don't know what's i agree on it Seth. yeah fully agree with that um i love the lights um you know the the fascia i, I think is fine i guess it it helped with the uh, coefficient of drag we dropped it down a little bit uh, which helps with the mileage um but overall i think it looks great i you know you know, I'm not always a fan of Tesla design. I'm a little bit on the fence, obviously, with the Cybertruck. But I really like this thing. Um, I like the front lights. I like the back lights. Um, and I love the uh, more aerodynamic. So mm -hmm. all good. The badging was uh, slightly updated, too. Now it reads out Tesla in the back rather than just the T. I mean, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, you briefly mentioned the... Um, better efficiency so it is resulting in a longer range there was a rumor about a battery pack update too with the new catl cells tesla in its usual manner has not released any details uh, under the hood uh, they did help the launch they did help some launch event in norway and, and in china uh, because the vehicle right now is uh only listed in europe and in asia it's not listed in north america right now it's still the whole mold three if you go to the Model 3 configurator, at least it was this morning when I check out and check. Uh, yeah, it's again. still, I just checked a few minutes ago. It's still the old one. So yeah. does that mean the the uh, the new, the Highland Model 3 is only coming out of China? That or what would China suggest, yeah. Uh, I should have yeah. checked in Canada too, because that would have confirmed it. Because it does ship to Canada now from China, not, but not in the U.S. for uh, import duties reason. So yeah, so we don't know exactly if they did change the battery pack but it, it is resulting in an 11 to 12 percent increase in wltp range to 421 miles for the long range version 344 miles for the standard range rear wheel drive version and so that might 
purely be explained through aerodynamics improvements? It's it's not clear. The new wheels as well. Yeah, the new wheels. That's what I was getting to now. The, the new wheels are nice, uh, nice new options, especially the new uh, Nova one with the, the blacked out uh, side. Or, or you don't see them very well in this picture here, but uh, it, they, are, they are very cool. I have a lot, like I was saying, a, a, quite a bit more interior changes than we originally expected. So uh, and the biggest one, I think the one that we listed first, I think that's the one that uh, makes a bigger difference for people, especially for people with, uh, with children's. Uh, the eight inch uh, rear touchscreen. So that was all previously only for mobile S and X. It has now made it to the, uh, the, the, the mobile three. Um, Deleted stock. So that's also one that has been talked about a lot, but it's a more controversial one. It's something that Tesla has already brought to other models. And sure. people, people are not too excited about it. It has been replaced again by the um, force touch buttons on the uh, on the steering wheel. So you either love it or hate it. Ventilated front seat. Uh, so that's nice. Cushier rear seat. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, that's nice. Uh, sound speed system been updated from 14 to 17 uh, speakers. Apparently, there's an improved Bluetooth microphone performance, improved Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity, uh, quieter interior, so that remains to be tested, uh, customizable interior ambient lighting. Well, yeah, there's a very nice new LED strip that goes all around the dash, which is uh, pretty cool. It's a nice little... Do we know if we can turn that off entirely? Well, it's customizable, so I would assume so. But uh, yeah, it, it, it like you can match the color of the of the of the car. You can match other things like that. So I think that's really cool. You can see it a little bit here. Uh, there, it's red right now. I mean, I have to be honest. One of the things I like about the Model Three so much is that it's really dark inside when you're driving at night. So I don't know if I would really want a, a LED strip, but obviously I would, some people. I would are. assume. I would assume that Tesla would have thought of that, and and when they say customizable, I would assume it's like you can remove it completely. Larger rear trunk uh, went from 561 liters to 594. It also looked like the opening may have been uh, increased a little bit. I I saw a picture of the back, and it looks like the top is rounded a little bit more. Yeah, they also have included the tail lights completely. The, the full tail lights assembly is in the trunk lid, so that should also open things up more. Uh, apparently, though, I didn't notice, but it's not approved in uh, in the U.S. to have your tail lights completely assembled. Like you can have them like halfway, or like there's a percentage, but not fully. So hmm. maybe Tesla's gonna have to change the design in the U.S. Maybe that's why it's not in the U.S. available right now. The the refresh version. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm very much looking. At, there's a price increase too. Also, it's a it's a little bit more expensive, but not much. I think it's like. 10% more, something like that. So we can forget about the Model 3 being the uh, $25,000, $30,000 car that uh, we were... Oh, I mean, it, it is with the discounts and the, and the right. incentive, but uh, not the next-gen platform. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. There's a, there's a chance we might see it next week at uh, IAA, you think? I think so. I would give it 50-50, to be honest. Yeah. I was I was like genuinely surprised that they didn't do it here. I mean, there's like a hundred thousand people running around FF, or, uh, IFA, and I uh, and they, you know, have they have a booth a, there, right? They have a booth, you know, like just roll it in. Yeah. All right, so Tesla kind of did a little news dump last night with that. So everyone focuses no. on the new Model Three Highland, but but there was a few things that would change at the same time. So the main one is little change in the uh, configurations and, and pricing for all S and X. Mainly, they, they killed the standard range already. So those software lock standard range that we talked about a few weeks ago that just launched uh, are now gone. And the slash the price of the long range version, which is now the standard one, to make them the same price of, and, and cheaper the, than the standard range. So this is not actually that big of a deal for Tesla because the standard range were the long range. It's just software right. lock. Same hardware. Was, yeah. So it's the same hardware. They just slashed the price. So 
probably that Tesla didn't like the response that they got from the orders of the standard range. And they were like, you know what? Let's just give them the long range and, and uh, at the same price because we were selling it for that price anyway. Yeah, but what if you bought one last week and you're still software? Oh, for could... sure, Tesla, Tesla has to refund you. It makes no sense whatsoever. Right. Uh, I'm not even sure they delivered any in the last... Uh, it's been two weeks, three weeks right. max. Two weeks, I think, since they launched this thing. So, uh, I mean, if you are one... So one there's those, not going to be any software locked Model S's? I would assume not. I would assume that either you get a refund or you 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 get it unlocked at the. I mean, the they price. knew this was happening. Maybe that was just like a, a bait and switch kind of thing. Like they didn't want to sell. They still wanted people to buy it at that more expensive price, but they wanted to kind of sell some more as well. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not so sure. But yeah, so so specifics. Uh, now the Model S starts at uh, seventy five thousand dollars. Uh, Which is so crazy. That, it's like the lowest price it's been in a long time. Yes, because because that's uh, thirty five hundred dollar less than the uh, previous one that was the standard range one, the software lock one. So it's even cheaper now. And same thing for the Model X, which now starts at seventy nine, well eighty thousand dollars basically, but just below eighty thousand dollars. So that what you get, you can get the full tax, tax credit, credit in the U.S. Yeah. So obviously this is not a good look for Tesla in terms of demand. Like it's, it shows that the demand for the S and X was uh, not at the level at all because those are massive, massive price cuts. Um, but I can also understand why, especially for um, Molo S, it's it, like it's the cheapest it's been for a while, like you said. So they're going to get some demand from, from that for sure. But in terms of the Molo X, um, a lot of people, they just they don't buy even though like they are on the market for a more luxury vehicle around that pricing and everything, they won't get one that it's electric because it doesn't have access to the tax credit and they feel like they're leaving money on the table. There's a lot of people right. like that. It's just, it's human nature. They're like, I or like, even though it's the Model X, I want, I want the Model X more than the Model Y and I can afford them all. Maybe you can even afford the Model X. You, like, you can buy it cash and everything, but you're going to get the Model Y anyway because you're like, why would I leave? The government is offering $7,500. I want that. It's just pure human nature. It's the problem with the way that the incentives are, are set up in the U.S. and in many markets. Many markets other than Norway, really. Norway is the only one that managed to avoid that by instead of incentivizing the EVs, they're penalizing the, the polluting cars, which probably makes more sense. Anyway, mm -hmm. anyway so now since the, for an SUV, the limit is $80,000 for pricing for the, the MSRP, now the base Model X is eligible for it. So I think that's going to be a big boost yep. in uh, in order and demand for the Model X because it is like arguably the, the top uh, SUV out there in terms of uh, performance and range and all that. And this might be the least expensive that Model X has ever been if you include the tax credit. Yeah, I mean, there was a standard range before, I think, that was around this price. But yeah, you're not with the tax credit. Yeah, with the tax credit, like this is basically a $75,000 car. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's getting there. And then also, like, if you are thinking about, you know, you're thinking about a 70 something thousand dollar third row EV, you know, you're thinking about a Rivian R1S, you're thinking about a <clears throat> upcoming Volvo or, uh, Kia, but now it's like you can get a Model X, almost a plaid version uh, for the same price as a Rivian. It's kind of, I mean, obviously a Rivian goes off road. It's a different vehicle altogether. But as far as third row EVs con are concerned, you know, Rivian's not like kind of a no brainer anymore. Yeah, it, it's uh, it shakes up the space. Like the space was sure. uh, w was getting settled now with the the, the Rivian and the, the the Volvo and the EV9 and all that. Like it was like this these were your options because Model X it was just not in the game. Now the Model like especially if you look at the average new car prices in the U.S. right now, like it's still a luxury vehicle. It's still a seventy thousand mm -hmm. plus vehicle, but it's, it's not it's not too bad when you look at what's on the market right now. Yep. All right, and the last thing that was like dropped on us last night is probably the most surprising one is a price cut on the full self-driving FSD package, three thousand dollar less in the U.S., thirty-five hundred dollar less in Canada, so that's twelve thousand dollars instead of fifteen thousand dollars. So that's that shakes up a lot of things now because, I mean, there's already a lot of 
things that are controversial about Tesla selling that package in the first place, Tesla increasing the price of the package over time, Elon claiming it's an appreciating asset, Tesla vehicles are becoming an appreciating asset because of that. Now, it, not, we already were laughing about that because it hasn't proven to be true so far uh, because Tesla itself devalues FSD on, on their trade-ins and all that, or at least they did before the whole... Uh, amnesty one-time amnesty that Elon's talking about until the end of the quarter but anyway that's neither here or there this is an actual price decrease on something that Elon has been telling any everyone that cares to listen that the price will keep increasing and Tesla improves the system and now at the same time it's a bit funny because Tesla just released this new update this week that I just got which I strongly believe that is a, a decrease in performance for for FSD beta so, so maybe Tesla is just very serious about this idea that they increase the price as performance improve, that they now even decrease the price as the performance decreases. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we can get into <clears throat> it, but this new update is is real bad in my opinion. But anyway, wait. So, do you think people who paid fifteen thousand over the last year or so should get a three thousand dollar credit? Yeah, I just I just uh, tweeted that actually. Like I I, I'm, I tweeted. If anyone actually paid fifteen thousand dollars for this thing, because I don't know of anyone that did, to be honest with you. Well, somebody, I'm, should, I'm sure. I'm, somebody I'm, I'm sure some people have. Uh, not a lot, though, because the take rate on this is less than eight percent globally, and we estimate like it's harder. Like, like globally, it makes sense that it's extremely low, just because FSD beta is not even available outside of North America. But even in North America, I think it's below fifteen percent take rate. Uh, and probably has gone down since it's been fifteen thousand uh, dollars, even though the, that has been since FSD beta came out. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know of any people that paid for it, but yeah, if you paid fifteen thousand dollars for it, I would request a three thousand uh, dollar rebate simply because you bought it with uh, Elon saying that <coughs> the price will keep increasing, which is incentivizing you to buy it now instead of buying later. And Tesla doesn't do anymore this thing where, oh, if you buy it before the, the delivery, you get it cheaper than after the delivery. So so now it's like completely up to, to you. You can have bought it. You can have bought the car two years ago and having bought uh, the FSD last week for $15,000. Like you would have been completely screwed of $3,000 for absolutely no reason. So, yeah, uh, I hope that Tesla is offering the, those, those uh, rebates right now. I doubt it's going to be like a big rebate program, though. If it's, no, I don't if think it's, it's like, going to be anything. But I think like, a lot of people are upset. Like, I, I would be super upset if I paid 15000 for FSD. For good reason, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. upset I paid like 7000 for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's the next article. We, we, we can get into it. But uh, I, I tried the FSD... Um, 11.4.7 that was pushed this week and and literally like i've normally i'm i careful with my choice of words here but it, it felt like it was trying to kill me last night driving from shawinigan to montreal i was on the uh, on uh, the 20 highway and uh i i say fsd beta on the highway now because autopilot is no more like if you have fsd beta it is the fsd that it's powering autopilot now since the the merger of the stacks with with v11 and, and what is happening right now is what I feared would happen with the merger of the stack because I was very comfortable with Autopilot. I thought it was doing very well on the highway. And I feared that that going with the merger, the stack merger with FSD would um, potentially give it a few step backs, which with Tesla, as to be fair, as warned about, they said that, it's, that FSD beta is a two step forwards, one step back. And I think this one is a big step back. Um, because it did something that it never used to do. You remember back in the day, Autopilot would, would sometimes try to take an exit that it's not supposed to. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was like the main issue. Like this and Phantom Braking was like the main issue with original Autopilot. But it was mostly fixed. Like I haven't had that problem literally in, in years. Uh, now I had some of that problem, but even worse, because it wasn't actually an exit ramp it tried to, it tried to take. So I was on the A20 and the car automatically passes a car. So it goes into the left lane to pass a car. And then as the, it, it passes a car, it veers to the, the, the median strip, like in the middle of nowhere. And I, I had my hands on the wheel, so I was able to correct it just in time before I go off road. And I was almost going to go into the other lane and over correct it, but I got 
right back in the center right away. I freaked out for a second. It was like real scary because I thought literally the car was trying to get me off road. I didn't I didn't see what was on the left side at all. It was just I was just looking ahead at the road. Um, and then, you know, when, when you take over control like that, uh, FSD disengages and it tells you like, uh, oh, you've disengaged with the pilot. Do you want to give some feedback? I was like, hell yeah, I want to give some feedback. So I get the voiceover thing and I'm like, I didn't know what happens. So I just told them, I just, the pilot just tried to kill me. So please fix it. Uh, so that they can at least like get the video of it. Why not? I was going to record a video myself. Like you can see in these pictures, I have like the little video screen on my car because I have my storage device attached to it. But the, the video thing was not on it. And I just realized that there at that moment. So I don't know, with that last update, it looks like my storage device is like not working anymore. I, I need to fix that or look into it because I, I don't know what's happening because I wish I had video of this. But then I was able to replicate the problem right after. So I reactivated FSD right after it, which I know people are like, hey, you just tried to kill you. What did you reactivate it? I reactivated very consciously that uh, let, let's see if, if I can replay, replicate what happens again. And sure enough, seconds later, after I, I, I grab it, I put my speed back to 118 kilometers an hour, which is my cruise control speed on the highways here in Quebec, which is reasonable speed. It's about 73 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I, I start passing a car on the left, and the car does the exact same thing, veers off to the left. But this time, I saw that there was one of those... Uh, I don't know how you call those, but like it's basically that a U-turn area for emergency vehicles. You're not supposed to go there, but like police vehicles with, with park yep. there to give people tickets and everything. So it saw that and tried to veer through that. Um, and that's extremely dangerous because that's not like taking a, an exit ramp that you're not supposed to. Because in that exit ramp, at least it, the exit ramp is designed for you to slow down in that exit ramp to take that curve. The, there there's no room to slow down at all so if you're in there you're in there and you, i was for sure gonna crash off road uh which I, would have been very dangerous or even more dangerous potentially is like as i correct it you, the risk of over correcting it and smashing into a car on the right lane which is likely to be there because when you're on the left lane i mean you're supposed to just use it to pass which is what i was doing in this case anyway so now I was able to send another bug report to Tesla and explain to them, even though it like it cut off in the middle of it as I was explaining to it. But I'm sure if they can pull the video, they're gonna they're gonna see what happened here. But this is a behavior that's brand new to this update that I've never seen that before, and it's very dangerous behavior. And after posting it this morning, I had a bunch of people that reached out to me. And they said that they saw the same thing. I I got some people saying that they got the same thing in this new update. What they realized it in this new update, so it might be very new. But I got some people that told me that the last update too, uh, or three point uh, like the eleven dot four point five, I think, uh, was uh, was also having this issue. So watch out out there. Always use FSD beta while you have your hands on the steering wheel and you're looking uh, looking uh, at the road, ready to take control at all time because this is uh, this is dangerous stuff. Yeah, as Carl in San Diego says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, Tesla kills you. Yeah, I mean, the second time I was, uh, I knew what I was doing. Like I, the first time I was already paying attention. I always pay attention. I don't, I don't screw around when I'm, I'm using FSD. But uh, I, I was doing it because I had a suspicion that maybe there was something on the left, but I, I just I couldn't see it because of, uh, uh, of uh, I wasn't looking that way. And it was at night too. And I realized right then, oh, I don't have, I cannot record this. I can, because you can go back 30 seconds and record this. Yeah, and can you honk the horn and, and it records or something? I know there's a way to do that, yes. But um, for me, it's just like, you don't really press the button on it. You press the, the camera button and that records the last 30 seconds. But hmm. I, it, the option was just not there, even though my storage device is connected. I wonder if... Uh... I wonder if that's a feature or a bug. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll, other than I, other than driving off the road, uh, was there any other like? It was pretty smooth. I, I yeah. was liking it until then. I was like, oh, this is actually a pretty good update until okay until that happened. So, um, the one article that I forgot to put in this morning is that Cybertruck one, which I think was pretty interesting. I'm gonna find it. Okay, right here. 
this new signing, I don't know where the signing is from on um, the Cybertruck Owners Club, the picture was were posted, but it doesn't say where it is. It looks like it's either a port or there's like a yeah, kind of a testing area when, and some pictures leaked. Um, but there's a few things why this signing is interesting. I want to get into it. First off, what is happening with those doors? I've, I've seen quite a few prototypes of the Cybertruck lately, and they have these doors that look horrific compared to the actual body panels. Right. So, I don't know if there are any like stainless steel expert that can get uh, explaining this, but uh, I don't want that on my truck. If I have that on my truck, it's go back, it goes back. Uh, but yeah, it's not actually the most interesting about this. Um, there's a, the hood was open and there's a sticker on the hood that confirms it's, it talks about a VIN in the 602, 602. So people say, oh, there's 602 cyber trucks out there. Uh, hmm. They can jump and skip some numbers. So I wouldn't say that, but. It looks like there might be hundreds of cyber trucks out there. That's a real possibility. But, um, the other thing is that it mentioned dual motor. That is a dual motor version of a cyber truck. Now there could be other version out there, but Tesla has been known that generally when they launch a new vehicle, when it launches a new vehicle, it focuses on a single version of that powertrain uh, for production at first. So if it was my guess, it would be that the first version of the cyber truck to launch would be the dual motor version. And then Tesla would launch a tri-motor or single motor later on. That is my best guess for now. Uh, a few other interesting things. There was this power supply device that was in the front. Which, uh, yeah, that looks like of, a, an inverter. Yeah, with a bunch of like hand-grounded outlets. And then these ones right here and a 12-volt one too. Uh, I don't know if this is for the prototype or this is something that's going to be like the interface and like the... The, tr the front uh, lining is going to go around it, and then you're going to be able to use that. It's not exactly clear, but... Uh, I, I imagine that there's going to be something like that because both the Silverado yeah. and the Ford F-150 have, you know, really good front power, so... Yeah, for Tesla's sure there's going to be something like that. I don't know. I just don't know if it's exactly going to be that because especially, like, all the ungrounded one is, is kind, of, it's kind of weird, right? You just don't... Right. You don't see plugs like that these days, like, Yes. And what's that thing in the bottom? It looks like a volume thing or something. The, this right here? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it was like a 12 volt, no? Oh, yeah, I, I guess it could be a 12 volt. A cap that you open up and it's like a 12 yeah. volt plug. Looks like that to me. Then you have some interior pictures. Uh, the, the front has leaked before. Uh, it looks not too updated from what we've seen. This looks like the latest version with the uh, phone holder, um, most likely wireless charging. Uh, the center console is is very much a fixed one now. It's not the seat anymore. It would be very surprising if it's a seat. And you get kind of a little glimpse at the back seat, which we haven't seen uh, since the uh, release candidates have uh, been coming out. Um, don't have a great look at the leg room, but in terms of headroom, looks pretty good. Looks like beefy seats in the back. Like the the side seats look quite beefy. I like I like what I'm seeing. No uh, third seat in the front anymore. I know initial yeah. cyber trucks had a three row front seat. Yeah, it was supposed to be a six seater. We haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah, looks like it's done. Then uh, we have uh, this thing right here in the back that says, how's my driving? Call 1-800-ELN-MUSK, uh, which seems to be just Tesla trolling. Uh, for its, uh, it, it, it appears to me that Tesla might have, the Tesla test engineers on the road might have some kind of uh, instruction to troll people with the t Cybertruck test vehicles between this and all of the, like the Tundra wrapped to Toyota Tundra wrapped Cybertruck and the F-150 wrapped Cybertruck. It looks like there's a, a team going on, a trolling team. Yeah, I mean, they know that the Cybertruck is like, you, when you see a Cybertruck, you know it's a Cybertruck. It's not like, yeah. you know, is that a Ford or a Chevy or whatever? Yeah. Like, so, I know it's going to... Good marketing, good advertising. Like, people just post them on social media. And they, but but those, those doors said, like, the... They scare me. Like, uh, if if they yeah, that is any, weird. And I've seen a few of prototypes that have that, so I don't know. It's the kind of the way they treat the stainless steel, and they don't do the same for the doors that they do for the rest of the other panels. And maybe it's just for testing right now, and and that the result. I don't know if there are any stainless steel experts out there that want to reach out to me and uh, explain the situation. 
uh, it would be worth it because it's going viral right now. And uh, I would like to uh, explain to people what's happening because I'm, I'm sure there's an explanation, right? Uh, all right, we have a few more news items we want to discuss, and then we're going to jump into the comment section, you guys. So if you guys have any questions or any EV topics you want us to discuss today, we're going to have a few minutes at the end of the show to talk about them. Uh, so you can uh, put that in the comment section right now if you're on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Not on X, though. Uh, not working with StreamYard right now. We're going to have to work on that. All right, uh, Biden administration announced a big... Uh, program for automakers this week uh, it's 15 billion dollars in funding available for retrofitting existing factories to produce electric vehicles or batteries so very nice program which is kind of a lifeline for legacy automakers because obviously it's gonna be aimed at them because they want uh they they, they, have, they are the, those that have the existing factories that to convert uh, but at the same time, it could be used by other like AV startups, like technically like Rivian, their factories where the R1S and R1T is being produced are being produced right now is a former Mitsubishi factory. So technically, they could uh, they could get some funding through, through that program because of that. Even Tesla, technically at Fremont, Fremont was a, a former uh, Toyota and GM factory. So that they revived through the electric uh, revolution. So these are all. Uh, programs that they could uh, they could use. So what is it? It's uh, $2 billion in grants, up to $10 billion in loans. Uh, some people are like, oh, it's mostly loans and everything. Like, uh, go 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 try to get a, a big loan right now from a bank. Like, <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna be a fun process with a very high interest rate. Like, uh, I'm sure these companies are very happy about these government loans. <laughs> uh, then uh, there's also separately $3.5 billion in funding to expand domestic manufacturing of battery cells for electric vehicle and the nation's grid. So it sounds like both batteries for EVs and for stationary storage. Uh, there is a little uh, caveat, though, obviously. I mean, it's, it's half a caveat because we know that the Biden administration is very close to the unions and they have been, they, they've tried before to attach incentives about electric vehicles to unionization effort, most famously with the federal tax credit reform last year it was briefly attached to you need to be from uh, the vehicles in order to be eligible for the tax credit need to be produced by union workers uh it was eventually killed because it's it goes against the reason why you're getting an, an incentive on an electric vehicle versus a gasoline one it's because to represent the fact that it's as a much smaller impact on the environment than the gasoline producing one it, it's not because it gives union jobs. It's, it doesn't work like that. If you want to have an incentive for vehicles to buy vehicles from union jobs, you can have that, but separately from the, the EV ones, it makes no sense. Anyway, they do mention in there that uh, uh, it is for for the domestic conversion grant. So for the grant specifically, it's not for the loan program. It's for the grants program, which is free money basically. Uh, they will give a higher scores to projects that retain collective bargaining agreements, uh, so union jobs, and or those with high existing, high quality, high wage, hourly production of workforce. So technically, if you are a good employer and without a union and you just pay your employee well and have a nice working environment, you should be fine too. But when they've used that language, normally it's kind of a, a wink, wink. Uh, you need to pay your union fees. Um, but anyway, it's still it's still a good program, and I hope that people are going to take advantage of it. Because, But I called it a lifeline to legacy automakers, and that uh, upset some people. Uh, I mean, look at some of the legacy automakers trying to make EVs profitably right now. It's uh, The list is short. There's not, it's, it's hard right now to make money uh, making electric vehicles for legacy automakers or for anyone that's not Tesla, really. <laughs> NBYD, I should say. Um, so in the US, anyone but Tesla. I like Ford with the separation of the business. And I, I like Ford. I like the fact that they separated the business so we can actually get a good look into what it looks like to be a legacy automaker transitioning into EVs. And uh, it is hard. So these uh, these kinds of, uh, of programs are going to help a lot. All right, I don't know if you saw this uh, coming this week, said, but uh, the Mercedes-Benz e-Sprinter van, the new generation with the longer range, it just got its uh, U.S. pricing. 
And uh, I don't know, people have been on the fence. Some people was like, oh, this is a good pricing. Some people was like, oh, way too expensive. But again, you have to look everything through the lens of everything is more expensive now and because the dollar is devalued and inflation and all that. So it starts at um, under 72. No, I thought it was a little bit more than that. Uh, no, okay, yeah. The 2024 starts at an MSRP of uh, $72,000 for the standard charging capabilities one and $75,300 for the high output version. So what is the difference between the two? It's 50. Yeah, okay. So one is maxed out at 50 kilowatts of DC fast charging and the other one goes to 115. That's dumb as hell. Uh, yep. Uh, you shouldn't sell a vehicle. I mean, but I, I get it. I, I get it, actually. So for if you're just going to use it, it's gonna because a lot of those are used for commercial purposes, obviously. So if you you know that your the way you're gonna use it doesn't require you to fast charge during the day, then I guess you can save three thousand, uh, yeah, almost four thousand dollars and and get the cheaper version. But to be honest, even the hundred and fifteen thousand cap one is uh, kind of low, right? Well, yeah, yeah fifteen for a big battery like that. 100, yeah, hundred uh... hundred fifty at the very least. It's a 130 kilowatt hour, 13 kilowatt hour battery pack. So, but it's so at least, okay, so forget about the 72,000 version, $75,000 version. So you can actually get some decent fast charging out of it. Uh, at $75,000, you get a range of, don't give us a range here. Uh, 500 kilometers, 311 miles. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's probably WLTP if I had to guess. Yep. But you're going to get over 200 miles out of that thing, EPA, I would assume. Yeah, and you've got a nice big battery for, uh, you know, let's just, let's just keep it at camping because that's all I really care about. Yeah, so that's what people are talking about right now. It's like you, they're gonna. There's plenty of companies out there that specialize in turning a Sprinter van into a camper. It's not cheap either, but now at least you have your base price. You have that $75,000 base price in the U.S. And then you can probably expect to pay anywhere from $20,000 for a very, very, very basic camper version up to probably $100,000 more. I, I've seen these things go for $200,000 plus easily. Um, but now at least you have an idea of what's, what it's going to be. Because th this is not the first e-sprinter version. It was the, the previous generation. But the previous generation has like a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack and was barely doing 100 miles of range. So it wasn't, wasn't a viable option for, for a camper. This one is, and it starts at $75,000. So I'm sure there's going to be a big market for that. It's, there's something so cool about the idea of like not having to pay for gas. Just, you can put some solar panels on it if you want, trickle charge it, just leave it for a week at some place, have your e-bike in the back, just bike yeah. around, and then up, oh, you're fully charged. And like, like, let's go 200 miles, 400 miles uh, if you stop for a DC fast charge. And all you have to pay is like that DC fast charge. And you had already 200 miles in from the sun on the solar panel on top. Like, this is, this is so cool. Maybe not a week. You would need, unless you have like deployable solar panels, maybe. Right. You could do it pretty fast. But in a week, if you just have the, the top covered, uh, maybe not 200 miles out of it. I feel like Mercedes should should offer some, like a panels option. I mean, how hard could it be? Just throw some panels on the roof and, you know, wire it down to the battery. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's, like, there's, there's going to be third parties that are going to offer it for sure. I don't know if Mercedes wants to get into that. But does yeah. Mercedes? I'm sure does Mercedes has its own Kemper version that they sell in Europe. No, they don't sell their. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, but they they do have some solar stuff like that EQXX had a solar panel. Mm -hmm. All right, this was uh, big news this week. Um, Ford is retiring three uh, internal combustion engine models. Uh, to make some space in their lineup for electric vehicles. Uh, the three models are as followed, the Ford Escape, the Edge, and the Transit Connect. Uh, according to Automotive News, is uh, they are all being um, sunset. Along with the Fiesta that was announced just a few months ago, they announced that the Fiesta is dead. I think the Fiesta was already dead for a while in North America, though, right? Uh, I think yeah. it was only in Europe. Yeah, they killed all cars except the Mustang. Yeah. 
so now even in Europe, those those cars and, and the Escape obviously is coming as an electric version uh, in, in Europe. It's the Escape that's coming as the electric version, I think. Or no, the Explorer is. No, sorry, it's Explorer. Um, yeah, and the Edge. What's a Ford Edge? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> is that that's a that was in Europe only too? It was it was a car? It was not a SUV, a crossover? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, no, that's a Mustang. Oh yeah, Ford. Ford is the one like you know, from all the legacy automakers that I like their approach the most. Like I think it's uh, they take it the most serious. All right, should we go into the comment section? Yep. All right. All right. So before we even started, Peter Moraine says theory Model Three performance is dead with the price drop of Model S. It's Existence only models Tesla's product categories. Highland is releasing only two trims, and this isn't changing. It's an interesting point. Uh, with the Model S dropping in price so much, it's almost close to where the uh, Model 3 performance was. But I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think the Model 3 performance was all was ever like a very popular version of the car, too. I don't see that many out there. I have one. I like it. Uh, but uh, it's it's overkill for what? what it is like it's um if i were to buy a new model 3 right now i would i would buy a long range i wouldn't buy a performance version now with the why is that s why, why wouldn't you buy a performance uh, i mean i like i get i get track mode which i've right. used like three times since i had right. a car like I just I don't use it that much. I was talking to my friend Bastien actually, and he, he, he said, "Oh, I wish I would have bought the Model Three Performance for the track mode." I'm like, "Oh, you, like, so there's people like that for sure." You could trade. Uh, that, I mean, I mean, some people. It's not just because of the actual use on the track, though. You can do things like you, you can remove right. the, the the ABS system and all that. So you, there, there's value for that. Some people, especially in Quebec, here they love that for like the winter. But yeah. Uh, and if you go with the Model S, because of the Model S price cut, yeah, I can see what you're saying. Though, of course, the Model S, so you would, it, it would mean that you prefer the Model S long range over a Model 3 performance. Because if you start comparing it with the Plaid, though, if you want actually the Plaid performance, then then it, it starts to be a lot, big, like a much bigger difference in pricing. So, uh, But I assume that you're saying that, oh, the long range is just as good performance as the Model 3 performance, then that's fair. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what uh, Tesla does, how it shakes out. Mm -hmm. Carl in San Diego says Tesla Model S and X price slashing looks desperate. And, you know, the, the stock price was down, I think, 5% today, but not, yeah, not just I mean, based on that. Yeah. Uh, that and the, the FSD, I think there was not that much bad news other than that. May, or maybe like it's sell the news on the Model 3 Island, I guess, but. I mean, Model 3 Island looks like a good launch to me, other than the messiness of like just being in Europe and Asia rather than North America. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt that Tesla is having issues selling them all S and X right now. And that's why there's uh, big price cuts. Yeah. And I, I wonder if people are stressed out about not having a gear shifter on the stock of the Model 3. And mm, the, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't right, know. Glenn Sanford. They give an impact that has. Yeah. Uh, I really wish I hadn't bought it FSD. I put a deposit down on the refresh straight away, but I just don't want to lose the 6,000 pounds. Yeah, I guess nobody really wants full self-driving at the moment. Uh, Shane O'Sullivan says, overall, it's a solid update, but there were a lot of rumors of Model 3 battery. That might be a bit of a disappointment. So Model 3... Performance well, yeah, battery. MP, like multi performance battery. You know? um, I don't know. I, I remember the rumor of the new CT, CTL battery, but exclusive to the performance. I don't know. Or maybe yeah. the M three P was the name of the battery. I'm not sure. Hmm. I don't remember. Uh, no right hand drive for Ireland or UK either. Oh, I didn't know that. So there's no right hand drive for the model. Oh, so this is Model S and X, and these come from Giga Shanghai, which has changed. No, he's talking about the Model Three. Is it is the model yeah, three that, coming in? Right uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna look into that because that would be actually big news because that will that is what happened for the model S and X, right? But model three and model Y were always gonna have right hand drive for 
especially for the UK. Uh, yeah, we're gonna look yeah, that, that would be surprising and, and kind of big news. I wonder if Tesla's gonna. Yeah, because the UK is a big market for Model Three, Model yeah. Y. So. And then you know, there's other big markets like Japan. Uh, Carl in San Diego should have a rainbow of colors for the Model Three if they still building them to order anyway. It's an easy way to increase interest and keep them competitive as more models are entering the field. I tend to agree with that. I, I think Tesla could really do some uh, interesting things with uh, colors beyond the red that they announced. Okay, sorry. So Shane just clarified that the M3P is the name of the CATL batteries. That's that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're gonna have to wait and see, uh, wait for some deliveries and work on some breakdown because Tesla is like is not saying anything anymore about their batteries. You have to guess everything. It's so dumb. Like, you don't even know what kind of batteries you get in your car that you paid for. It's my car. Tell me what kind of batteries in there. So dumb. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, Carl is right. Also, I should mention that the Model S and X also these the. the remove the up pricing for the different colors on the SNX. So that's another price cut, I guess. Significant one, too. Yeah, that's actually a big deal. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's desperation. I think it's just a good choice. All right. Uh, David WS, does it have vehicle to load or vehicle to grid? Um, we did see that in the Cybertruck, the kind of a vehicle to load, but nothing new in the yeah, that's another thing we're gonna have to confirm to uh, uh, some some um, breakdowns. But um, officially, I think Tesla has only said that Cybertruck onward are gonna be uh, vehicle to grid capable. Uh, Shane Sullivan, is it unusual that they didn't do an event for it? It's significant of an update to warrant one. I did kind of think this is something that they could have. At least had a small. I know. I guess they did have a. They event did have in an event in Asia and an event in Norway to launch the vehicle uh, with a select few uh, media there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't even like a press release packet like sent out to people. Like Tesla is like they don't they don't do any of that now, which which is yeah. like I like people are gonna get the information I, I, eventually, but it's just it's not it's not pretty. It's not a pretty launch. Like normally, like now people have to like dig out and like there's going to be more information out there like just do a nice press packet sending the people but apparently there, there were some people that had it because there were some people that had embargo and we posted the pictures the pictures leaked from the embargo um we weren't under embargo so we don't yeah. feel bad about posting the pictures we're completely allowed uh, but, yeah, but i so don't think was, there was any u.s know. media right no i don't think so it hasn't launched yeah, in the u.s because there's no u.s press like yeah you know press part so which is still a very weird thing but yeah that's another win third too so like it, people like I, what i don't like about when i keep because i know i keep saying like tesla should have a pr department and like one of the weirdest complaints that i get from people is like oh fred wants the media to have more information on tesla than um than the consumers <laughs> like every information about tesla that i have i give to the consumers we don't keep anything here Unless for very specific occasion to protect sources or anything like that, but like it's very rarely. So my point is for this case, like we we could talk if Tesla had a PR department, we could ask them the question that the consumer have, and that would be like, hey, what's what's happening with this launch? So it's only in Asia right now, only in Europe. Uh, why is that? Like we have our suspicion for it that we discussed earlier, but it would be nice to have some confirmation on that. And then on the other side, like, hey, so what? It, what is the plan for North America so that the consumer can prepare for it? So it's not us that doesn't want want to have more information than the consumer. It's Tesla that doesn't want to give the information to the consumer. They want to keep it because they are afraid that it's going to affect selling in the short term for the existing Model Three, of course. Yeah. All right, Carl in San Diego, who would you argue with about Tesla's unfair price shift? Your browser. Uh, I mean, theoretically, somebody at the sales office or at the, the, uh, yeah, you know, salespeople. Yeah. Uh, no vehicle okay. to grid. They definitely would have said so. Uh, LinkedIn user says, I received an updated contract with a discount applied to it, Model X, while waiting for the delivery. Unheard of from legacy audit manufacturers. Well, you don't really see the price drops like that either. So, yeah, that is like, it's not you cannot dig them on that because they're gonna change price based on the dealership and all that. So it's also before you receive a vehicle, 
if the price drops, you can just threaten them and say, Hey, if yeah. you don't give me the price, I'm just going to drop, you know, order a new one and, and drop this one. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't get why you would praise Tesla on that. Like, of course, I haven't taken right. delivery yet and you've slashed the price. You have to give me the price. Uh, Colin San Diego, do you have to pay extra for a third row and a Model X? Yeah, I think the Model X standard is just a, a two row and then they have like a six seat and then a seven seat. Yeah. <clears throat> FSD price cut also desperate and frustrating to fools who paid 15K. I think we talked about that. Uh, will shareholders have a valid lawsuit against Musk for the company think tanking if FSD is proven unsafe by NHTSA? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, nah, I don't, I don't see a how. Like, because I, for everything that Elon is saying about FSD, I think he believes that Tesla is going to get there. I don't think he's lying about that. <laughs> like, yeah, and you can't prove it anyway. You can't yeah, prove it. Yeah, and you, you, you can prove it, exactly. All right. I love the new Model 3, but I got such a good deal today. I bought one inventory for 36.6. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing with the, the update being not the biggest one, too. Like, there is still Model 3s available out there, especially in North America. So if you don't like with this just launch in Asia and, and uh, Europe, you're like, you can still grab them right now for pretty cheap. All right, uh, Gonzalo Zamora, do you think the UAW strike will have a positive impact on Tesla and Rivian in terms of sales? I don't know if the strike has actually happened yet. They're threatening one, right? Yeah, that's what I heard. I haven't heard that it started yet. Uh, I know, like, there's the, like the the industry is having problems after problems. Toyota had to shut down all their production in Japan because of a problem, and now this is happening. So. I don't know. I know. I just know it. It's hard right now to have workers and uh, keep like I. I don't envy anyone that it's uh, as uh, to operate with a lot of employees like that. It's uh, all right. Both, uh, both sides. It's hard. Yeah. Question: Will Model X third row versions qualify for federal rebate? If not, it seems like demand from price decrease would be limited. Yeah, how I does don't that work? know how popular the third row is. Like, I I, I know some, a lot of people want that. Uh, I don't think it will. Uh, but so to, to answer the question, no, and I, I don't think it will qualify because as soon as you get over eighty thousand, you don't get it. Uh, but uh, that there's still a lot a lot of demand for the Model X that with, with a five seat configuration or six seat configuration. All right, Fred will be called in front of a grand jury. Do you not see how egregious it is that Tesla is hosting this dumpster fire called FSD? Uh, I guess that would make uh, a good story. Don't, don't call me in front of a grand jury. Yeah, you don't want to do that. No jury stuff is fun. Yeah. All right, Mark Webb, you were supposed to press the horn to record. Yes. Um, but I think that's a setting, so you have to set that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, paying 12000 or 15000 to risk your life. Or we we're talking about FSD. Moving on. Um, cyber truck looks like car Russians would have designed. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe I don't know if that's very nice to Russians. Talk about <laughs> a value add. Uh, that inverter looks like an afterthought. We're talking about the cyber truck inverter now. Yeah. This, that's what I mean. It's not necessarily what's going to be in the final production version. Like this might be just, uh, for the prototype. Like it, it didn't look like it would fit nicely with, uh, once the, what do you call that? The, the, fitting that goes over the front like that uh yeah i don't know if there's a word for it but uh mr turkey neck says uh, looks like an eco flow unit yeah it, it looked it looked like a third party unit yeah right um oh so that was the other thing um before they were talking about how uh they were going to make everything instead of a 12 volt system a 48 volt system in the cyber truck do we know if that is the case or yeah i think they confirmed that no yeah I think that was the latest thinking. Things can always change. Um, so in regards to the doors being weird, uh, brushed stainless steel is difficult to control consistency. Um, and then Fremont was Numi. Seattle, Vienna says, in many European countries, you're supposed to signal when you're about to exit a roundabout. Will be interesting without stocks on such a high volume car. I mean, uh, you still have, like, in the run theoretically, 
Theoretically, if it's full self-driving and doing the right thing, it should signal. Well, that's the whole idea behind it. Like uh, any input is a mistake. Uh, it, right. That's the way it's designed for. But obviously, not everyone. Well, not everyone even buy the full self-driving. But like, Tesla is still selling the car without full self-driving. So you can, thinking like that is kind of uh, thinking ahead a little bit. Yeah. All right. With the price drop for the SNX, could there be another upgrade coming? Perhaps structural battery. Uh, yeah, it's not impossible. I, I, I think it's more demand driven than it is uh, a sign of an update. I think let's just put it that way. All right. Uh, David WS thinks it's the, that inverter was not just a power supply, not part of the vehicle. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, sprinters are a choice for rich van life people. Yes and no. I mean, yes, it's expensive, but there are I, I, there are like young people that do it and that's where they live like that's that's how they choose to live like especially like remote workers now they they prefer that life and it's a lot cheaper than a house like a lot of people yep. cannot afford a house these days like it's just you can be like a software engineer making a hundred thousand dollars a year and you cannot afford a house in many the like, big cities <laughs> especially with these interest rates you can maybe afford an $150,000 van, though. Yep. Uh, some in EV industry experts are saying that the mix of battery tech being brought online in the U.S. in the next few years is the wrong mix of LFP and NCM. Thoughts on that? I, I guess uh, they're I, thinking I, LFP should be more and, and less but it, NCM. But it's coming. LFP, like Ford, has announced several uh, plans for that. CATL also coming to the U.S., uh, so I, I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, I, I think it's fairly recent that LFP has, uh, has increased in capacity enough that it is a viable option for a shorter range vehicle. So it makes sense that it's, it's not the top investment yet. Uh, companies that are looking ahead like Tesla, like Ford are, are seeing it and are investing in, in it. But uh, um, yeah, it makes sense for me right now that the, the mix is if you're on the NCM side of things, on the on the nickel chemistry, I, I'm not I'm not concerned by that really. I think there's right. going to be a big mix over time. Like the nickel is not going away; it's it's still going to be there. All right, Carl in San Diego, e Sprinter could get WLTP range if you drive it slowly, like a VW microbus. I mean, you're not going to uh, drive it fast either. <laughs> yeah, and also it's got a big battery pack, like yeah. uh, 115 kilowatts kilowatt hours. I think. Uh, I think you can drive it pretty normally and get some yeah, good range. Just like the ID Buzz. I mean, I think the ID Buzz, I don't even I don't know if the ID Buzz is more efficient though. It's not as high for sure, but it is like a flat front and, and all that. So I don't like you give me a choice between an ID Buzz and an e printer. For sleeping with, in, for camping, or just for to, for the base of I'm gonna turn it into a camper after. Hmm. I think I go with the e printer. Yeah, I mean, it's more, way, way more space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edge is a crossover. That's what I was All right, Stu asks, when will Tesla fans admit that brand damage is having an effect on sales? You have to categorize, compartmentalize Tesla fans these days. I think a lot of Tesla fans, like myself, see it happening. However, I, I would argue that the bigger problem with demand right now is not, and brand damage is not, uh, well, I mean, the sales are okay. So demand, brand damage, I think, demand, I think that the demand is not mainly affected by brand damage. I think it's the microeconomic situation right now that makes just any large purchases more difficult for most people. Now, however, I think that brand damage is affecting sales too. Uh, at a lower rate that is the micro economics. Who cannot admit that? A lot of Tesla fans can admit that. A lot of like Tesla super fan or people that are stuck in the Elon Musk cult of personality cannot admit it because that would, that would, maybe they think it, but they are not admitting it out loud because then they will not be in the cult anymore. They get rejected by the leader. Yeah. Leaders, I should say, because now it's like, Elon has his own right. minions. Yeah. 
Shannon Sullivan says solar inverter manufacturer K-Star, who were the first to use cattle LFP batteries for home storage in 2020, today launched a new lithium titanate bat battery with 16,000 cycles and negative 40 degrees Celsius operating range. Those are both uh, good things. We'll have to check into that. Yeah, I assume that the energy density is not high, but if it's for home storage, it's not that big of a deal as long as you have the space for it. All right, Jay Hill says, which EVs will or can supply 240 to my house? Obviously, the Ford F-150 is probably still alone in that. Um, you can obviously get an inverter and go off the 12-volt system and get 240 out, but um, you won't get that many amps. But... Uh, Hopefully more things come along with that. I think the Silverado, uh, not the initial Silverado, but the RS version is going to have something like that at the end of this year. Uh, Stu, most Tesla promoters keep calling for advertising. Aren't most likely EV customers aware of Tesla? Or isn't brand damage with all the hard data more likely? Yeah, probably. I don't know. I don't know what advertising would do for Tesla. I think everybody's pretty aware of it. Uh, they can I, I kind of tell a story, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's still approaches that you can take that, uh, I, I mean, especially in cost of ownership, things like that, like you, you, you can make some push in that sense. A lot of people, like, just think they cannot afford it. And again, I think the micro economy makes it a bigger problem. And now some people literally can't. Some people that would be would have been able to afford it before can't now. Uh, but... I, a lot of people just don't think that it's feasible and it is when you account for the overall cost of ownership. All right. Shannon Sullivan says the 31, sorry, the 21 inch Uber turbine is an attractive part of that model three performance other than performance, obviously. Uh, I, th I do think big wheels look good, but I think they, they, um, they give a really poor ride and they also reduce the, uh, the range so yeah not a big fan there yeah i drove all across the u.s on a road trip with tw with 20 inch wheels from all it's not 21 but i think it's 20 and uh it's not a smooth ride not good yeah all right mr turkey neck has a generic question does an ev battery suffer any degradation just sitting in your garage without any internal drain like sentry mode etc for extended period uh, well, I mean, there's not a lot of information in there, so I assume like it's not plugged in. So if it's not plugged in, it's not necessarily a problem until you get below a certain state of charge. So Tesla warns against going below 20% for an extended period of time. Um, so other than that, if you just charge it to 80, 100% and then let it sit there, discharge and at 20 percent you charge it again or whatever after a week of you're sitting there or whatnot more than a week actually you could see you could stay a few weeks until getting uh to 20 percent uh then it shouldn't be a problem all right shana sullivan says the new refreshed model 3 highland is not launching in ireland and the uk until 2024 apparently so that's the left-handed driver so that's what they mean by not being rear-wheel drive available i think uh, no rear wheel drive, uh, right hand, right hand drive. I think. Um, did you hear a rumor that Highland would move to eight hundred volt architecture? I don't think I did personally. Yeah, I didn't hear that. I would be shocked if that's the case. Right. Not impossible though. Uh, Stu says Mercedes and Rivian sales uptick in the U.S. Uh, we don't really have any numbers based, really. Although Rivian is making more vehicles now. Personally. Yeah, and and Mercedes has been doing surprisingly well with the eqs stuff yeah. even though it's super expensive uh we like we said we weren't more impressed by the eqb eqc but uh there was some price changes uh, some updates so maybe that's gonna help but uh yeah i mean it's uh the market is maturing that's what's uh, what's really cool uh what we're saying like especially like in china like they have so many options in norway they've been drowning in evs forever now in the us it's always been a little bit more difficult um, especially with the hunger that people have for bigger vehicle trucks and all that. Now we're starting to see a lot more options happening. Like you, 
take what you want about what the cyber trucks look like. I think it's going to shake up the market a lot. It's going to make things a lot more interesting. If the interest rates can come down to at the same time and we, we can start to see um, uh, an easier market for a new vehicle purchase, at the same time as you have the F-150 Lightning, the Silverado, uh, the whatever they call the Ram electric one, uh, mm. uh, whatever it is, and the Cybertruck at the same time, the U.S. market will finally be able to jump, and 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 that's that's going to change everything too, because like all these like screwed up Bloomberg prediction that all they always crank up every year because they cannot predict past their nose, uh, yeah. they they're gonna they're gonna change completely because now everyone the the demand in the U.S. going to go from like a six percent EVs to like fifteen percent in right, probably a year, eighteen months, I think something like that, mm-hmm. and that jump going to have every all of those analysts uh, change their predictions and everything. Uh, and instead of like 50% in 2030, whatever it is, going to be 60, 70%. And that's that's going to light a fire under a lot of these automakers that's taking things slow. And once that happens, it's just a snowball effect. And then the consumers, they're like, all right, like everything is coming electric. Like my next car needs to be electric. And then instead of like 30% of people thinking that their next car is going to be electric, it's going to be 70% of people. And then once people hear that 70% of people uh, are buying electric for the next car, then it's going to be 100% of people because people don't want to be left in that 30%. So it's all a snowball effect. So my prediction that I've been saying for years that after 2025, there's not someone in their right mind that's going to want to purchase a new car that is not electric i think it's uh it's basically gold right now that prediction all right that's it for us this week everyone uh we went an hour six so set is about to fall asleep at the keyboard right now because he's in europe uh and uh I uh, appreciate every single one of you that's listening right now. If you do enjoy the show, please give us a thumbs up, a subscribe. You can give us a five-star rating on your podcast app too. That helps the show a lot. It's free to do. It takes a second. Uh, next week, we're going to be in uh, Munich for uh, IAA. If, you're, uh, if you see us there, uh, give us a high five. We're always willing to talk to uh, our readers or listeners. And uh, the show, the show is going to be, we're going to maybe be not at the same time. I don't know, you're going to be back in the U.S. by Friday, right? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Is that yet. the seventh? I might be fine uh, on this. No, seven. it's gonna be the eighth. The eighth, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, I will be. Yeah. Well, yeah, I should be back in the U.S. by the eighth. Yeah, it's gonna be a, the other way around. You're gonna be back in the U.S. I'm gonna still be in Europe. I'm gonna be in Greece by that time. But we're gonna figure out a time to make this show work. And maybe we'll do a live. We'll do a live uh, IFA, or sorry. Yeah, IAA maybe show. at the end of the, yeah, yeah. We can do like earlier in the week, like on a Thursday or Wednesday when all the news has come out from, from the uh, the show and we can discuss that. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, we, we're going to make it work and we're going to see you next week. Have a safe weekend and have fun.